came up and said, look, we're going to build you a temporary facility, which is um, uh, like a small compound of, of ATCO sheds, um, you know, and, and we were meant to be there for, I think it was about two years max. And that turned into um, uh, about seven or eight years. Deep inside each footy club is the story of how it came to be. Team Builders goes behind the scenes with those who made it all happen to give insight into the creation of some of Australia's biggest football franchises. With Tasmania in the early stages of building a standalone club after finally being granted a license to enter the AFL in 2028, the first new club to enter the national competition in 16 years, Team Builders will look back on all the startup teams that joined the then VFL as it expanded beyond the confines of Victoria. From South Melbourne's move to Sydney in 1982, to the Eagles and Bears in 1987, through to Gold Coast and GWS in 2011 and 2012 respectively, we'll talk to inaugural CEOs, presidents, coaches and star players to get an inside look into how these AFL teams were built from scratch. This is AFL Team Builders. Welcome to AFL Team Builders. In this episode, we explore the AFL's second foray into the Queensland market, the Gold Coast Suns. Almost a quarter of a century after Brisbane's calamitous launch in 1987, the Suns endured just as many, if not more, struggles, albeit with a much longer timeline and considerably more assistance from the AFL. And it's easy to forget that Gold Coast formation pretty much happened by accident. In the mid-2000s, the AFL, under CEO Andrew Demetrio, began to investigate further expansion with the high growth areas of Gold Coast and Western Sydney prime targets. At the time, North Melbourne was in perilous financial shape and had agreed to play 10 matches on the Gold Coast in a bid to boost their bottom line. With the AFL keen to add a second team up north, the Kangaroos move fueled speculation the Shinboners would eventually relocate permanently to sunny Queensland, especially with a $100 million carrot from the AFL dangling in front of them if they did jump ship. Behind the scenes, a group of Gold Coast business people came together to help the AFL assess the landscape. Should North Melbourne, as expected, take the juicy relocation package and set up in Queensland? Of course, they never did. President James Brayshaw campaigned to keep North at North, and the proud Kangaroos stayed put at their spiritual home on Arden Street. The Kangaroos' decision to snub the move came as a huge shock to those at HQ, as inaugural Suns chairman John Witheriff recalls. Witheriff was a well-known local business leader who was working with a consortium behind the scenes to ensure the kangaroo's move would be viable on the Gold Coast. He recalls the kangaroo's about face coming so late in the process that it blindsided many of those involved and turned the Gold Coast situation on its head. We got into 2007 and you might recall that the, the thrust of AFL thinking at the time was to relocate uh, teams out of Melbourne uh, give them a financial support package and then put them in places that are going to be growing and therefore access new sources of revenue, grow the, the game's footprint. And so the, the plan was to move North Melbourne north and the idea was there was an established club and at that point in time they wanted to understand what would be uh, needed to make it successful. And so we gathered at the North Cliff Surf Club for the big announcement. A number of leading uh, North's players uh, had been flown up. Um, there was a stage constructed. Uh, the AFL PR organisation was in full flight. Gil McLaughlin was um, on the phone uh, to Andrew Demetrio. There was uh, an announcement to be made. The uh, Gold Coast Bulletin, uh, the Murdoch publication, had been uh, briefed and they were ready to roll with the front page that had already been written about, uh, about how, the, uh, how the Gold Coast was going to have its own team uh, because the editor at the time, Bob Gordon, who was a highly regarded editor within News Limited, had, uh, was part of our organising committee. And so uh, everyone was waiting for the announcement and to everyone's surprise, I guess mostly... Uh, uh, Gil McLaughlin's, it turned out that uh, uh, North, in fact, voted it down and they weren't moving. Uh, so I recall the editor, Bob Gordon, saying to him, well, I'm still running the front, and uh, I guess we all left the uh, announcement at, at Northcliff Surf Club in a state of shock. Gil grabbed uh, Graham Downey, who had not long retired as chairman of the Brisbane Lions, and myself, and we went to a restaurant in Broadbeach and sat down and... Uh, 
And Gil said, we've got a problem. And uh, and I recall uh, Graham saying to him, well, I don't think we've got a problem, Gil. I think you've got a problem. And that was the start of uh, the process. I'm guess- I guess it's true to say that until that point, um, none of us really thought uh, that we'd be building a team um, uh, from scratch. And it was late 2007. Um, that's when the hard work really began. Once Witheriff and his fellow key stakeholders were able to stop their heads from spinning, they soon realised there was an enormous opportunity staring them in the face, a standalone Gold Coast footy club. The AFL too was determined to expand into the non-traditional football market, with the knowledge two extra teams across Queensland and New South Wales would lead to huge financial growth in terms of broadcast, media revenue and participation became pretty apparent that South East Queensland and Western Sydney were markets which would tick all of those boxes. Uh, and so at the time that we were going through this, you know, North Melbourne work, you had in parallel this other driver uh, coming up that cr- would create uh, the opportunity that we're now seeing uh, throughout the competition. You know, uh, we saw a, a $780 million four-year deal turn into more in the last deal, I think it was a $4.2 billion deal. Um, media rights deal. So uh, again, the vision of these uh, guys, you know, Demetrio, McLaughlin, Catterall, um, was extraordinary um, in uh, in pulling that together. There was an incredible opportunity that the city couldn't miss. And so for me, it was an opportunity that I couldn't allow to slip. And I was uniquely placed to facilitate it. I needed to bring in the best people who understood football. Um, I needed to get people who understood infrastructure, people who understood the city, because we needed to get a very good football outcome. We needed to get a stadium built and we needed to uh, ensure that this organisation was going to be sustainable for 50 years and not go the way of other organisations that had uh, been here before or been on the Gold Coast before. It was a far broader remit than just coming up with, you know, 18 players who could win a grand final. Uh, Because, uh, yes, we might have won a grand final in year one in an idealistic uh, world, but if the team was gone in year four, uh, as had been the case with other football teams, then um, then that whole effort was worth nothing. So we had to build a sustainable organisation, a sustainable club, and that's what we went about doing. So with North Melbourne out of the picture, Witheriff and his group of community and industry representatives were tasked with investigating whether a standalone AFL licence on the Gold Coast would be a viable long-term solution instead. GC17, as it was then monikered, was born. Curiously, the AFL had formally registered the name Gold Coast Football Club before any business case had ever been produced, highlighting just how determined the league was to launch a second club in the high-growth Queensland region. The green light for the AFL's 17th team finally came on 31st of March 2009, just hours before the calendar ticked into April Fool's Day. I'm pleased to announce that the AFL Commission has resolved by resolution to award the Gold Coast Football Club a licence to become the 17th club in the AFL Club at Kipri. Gold Coast would officially take the field for the 2011 season, with two years to prepare for their entry into the big league. There was a mountain of work to complete. Andrew Thomas was a member of the Suns' GC17 bid team before becoming the new franchise's first full-time employee as a business development executive with a focus on setting up the commercial aspects of the club. He remembers fighting an uphill battle when it came to trying to win the hearts and minds of the Gold Coast community as the club laid its foundations. Also Clyde Palmer's A-League soccer team were were sort of running around as well. So I remember going out to people and trying to get these pledges and and saying, um, I'm from the Gold Coast Football Club or GC17. And the first thing they'd say is, oh, I don't really like the soccer. And uh, so, so we had an education process to probably go through locally. Um, there's a lot of expats here from Melbourne, and that's certainly grown again post-COVID. But um, it was tough. I mean, I, I often talk to my sales team now about, you know, we used to run a golf day back then to, to try and fundraise for the bid, and I, I couldn't get 10 people to go, um, and it was free. So you, 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 it was very, very difficult. Um, but that's completely changed now. Fast forward 15 years and you've, you know, we've got a men's and women's side and um, a hell of a lot of work has been done at grassroots to, to sort of build um, the game in this region. And I think we're doing a reasonable job. But, yeah, certainly early days, Neil, not, not going to lie, or sugarcoat it, it was probably harder than 
um, we'd anticipated. You know, when the CEO of the AFL comes up and says, license has been awarded, you're in the TAC Cup competition, um, I think that then we had the, the name of Gold Coast Football Club. It wasn't the Suns, but it was Gold Coast Football Club. It, it, was, it was about, okay, well, what do we do now? And, and they said, well, these are the roles that we've got to put on and these are, you know, we've got to build a structure and we've got to build a team. And so they went about the process of, setting a, of appointing a CEO first and foremost and transitioning out of a, a project manager of sorts for the bid and, and getting a, a CEO. And, and once we appointed our inaugural CEO, which is obviously Travis Auld, who's gone on to great things, he then built a structure around him and that that was everything from setting up a football program football department to an administrative team to getting um you know a tna base um but but what i will say neil is a, uh, that license was sort of predicated on funding for a stadium um and and i remember i think it was 2008 there was a not to get political on your on your podcast, but there there was a state election, and one side of government was committed to funding the venue, the stadium, and and um, Heritage Bank Stadium, as you see in its current form, the then Metricon Stadium, and the other side of government was was against funding for a new stadium. Now, similar to maybe what's going on with other licenses at the moment, um, had we not have achieved funding uh, back then, or or the right party had won at the right time, then we you know who knows what would have happened and. As luck would have it, um, the right side certainly from our point of view won won the state election, and thus we we got funding for a stadium and and a license was awarded and away we went. But yeah, I remember even then it was it was we we'd done all this work as a bid committee, but um, there was a fair bit that needed to happen to to get that stadium, and and the people voted, and and here we are. With a two year runway ahead of their AFL debut, the Suns had a two stage approach with their on field preparations. They played in the underage TAC Cup in 2009 and then in the VFL in 2010 under inaugural coach Guy McKenna. But what would their jumper look like? What would their nickname be? And what colours would feature on their branding? Hint, what you see today certainly wasn't what the public wanted. Wanting to ensure the team's identity resonated with the community, a public nomination and voting process for the nickname was carried out, with the Marlins and Stingrays the most popular of the available options among the community. Those options didn't fly with the AFL though, which announced the team would initially remain nameless to see how it evolved. However, it was later alleged the AFL's marketing department had chosen the Suns brand, independent of any community involvement. This was the first sign the AFL was going to be very, very hands-on with a club it desperately needed to succeed to help grow the game in Queensland. Thomas was heavily involved in the branding of the new club and recalls just how involved the AFL was in setting up the Suns. I remember fondly. It was all very public, so um, it's probably a few little secrets um, we can share. Um, but I remember we asked the community, it was in uh, 2008, the Gold Coast community, we went out through Hot Tomato and said, um, what do you want to call the new club if we were to get a licence? And there was a short list of five mascots. Um, I think it was the Iron Men, the Rays, the Stingrays, and a couple of others that, that escaped me. And at the time, um, our advisory group decided against the, the winner uh, of what, what the, the name was meant to be. And that was the name of the local elite development squad here at the time, which has now changed and, and become our academy. But it was the Gold Coast Stingrays were the, the sort of junior uh, pathway, if you like. Um, so it made sense to sort of mirror that. And the advisory group at the time decided, well, you know what, let's move away from that. We want to be known as something really simple. You know, you, you think about your big brands and, and they're quite simple. You think of McDonald's and you think of Apple and um, they wanted this GC symbol to be that. And they said, well, if we've got a mascot, people won't call it the Gold Coast. They'll call it the Stingrays. And, and they wanted people to know um, they wanted to have a strong tourism con connotation as well and Gold Coast and people to reference us as Gold Coast. And so the advisory group decided against that. It was an overwhelming stingrays. I think it was a couple of percent up and they were all quite quite equal. Iron Man even was was up there, I remember, um, which would have been interesting with a women's team that's just come in. They made that call and they said, well, you know, every single sporting team in our history, in, in whether it be basketball, soccer, rugby league, had been this blue and yellow colour. And they said, well, we want to be different. And and what what you know, what is the Gold Coast? Well, they red is the sun and yellow is the sand. Contrary to popular belief, everyone sort of thinks it was the surf life-saving flags, but it wasn't. 
was about the red of, of the sun and the yellow of the sand being our colours and how they'd come about. And so the group voted on that and, and they said, well, let's just call us the Gold Coast Football Club. Um, they commissioned an agency who set up Virgin Blue in Australia at the time they were called, now obviously Virgin Australia. Virgin Blue were, were only around for a couple of years at that point and wanted to be funky and cool and, and sort of like Virgin Blue were known when they started, a bit innovative, a bit bold. So we landed on, okay, well, let's go away from Stingrays, let's go Gold Coast Football Club, let's go red and yellow and be contrary to any single colour that's been before us. And we went out and... and um, and went to the public with that about three or four months later that quickly changed as we got a fair bit of feedback from Gold Coast just saying hey great love it but my kids that go to the footy can't actually say anything you know what do you want them to say go GC go Gold Coast go what's your mascot and uh, so the advisory group decided to pivot and they said well rather than consult the community again for a mascot sons some bright spark, I, I couldn't tell you who, came up with that at, at the advisory group and they debated it and said, well, we're going to go out with Gold Coast Suns and that is now the same thing, the same moniker, mascot that you see today at our games and that's sort of how that that came about. It gave us an, an identity. Like The Gold Coast Football Club, I know that we still get referenced as that, just as Carlton Football Club get referenced as Carlton, not Carlton Blues every time that they're spoken about, but kids... Kids associated more with a mascot than they do with a star player. That still happens today. So you could go to a clinic of five-year-olds and they want to see Sonny Ray, our mascot, you know, not Took Miller. Uh, now that changes as a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old, but certainly at the young young level, that's that's who you're trying to capture and they, you know, mascots appeal to that. Characters more so than, than the actual athlete themselves. So... It was a really smart move to probably pivot and, and and actually put your hand up at the time and say, you know what, we probably didn't get this right the first time. Let let's we'll, you know let's go again and see where that lands. And um, uh, you know, if you think now you couldn't imagine couldn't imagine us as anything other than the Gold Coast Suns. You know, a bit like the Fremantle Dockers or the Port Adelaide Power. I remember as a young fella hearing that and going, oh, that's a bit strange. But again, now you you can't imagine anything else. And so yeah, it was it was. We had two bites at it, which, you know, most people probably won't remember. But, uh, yeah, we got the right outcome in the end. And it was funny. We did a whole bunch of community consultation, got, but, but never actually went with what the community wanted. So, <laughs> um, yeah, but, we, you know, we've landed in a really positive space now, clearly. The club also had to settle on its theme song. Witheriff vividly remembers hosting some of the AFL's heavy hitters at his beach house to help choose the song which turned into a beer fueled sing-along session on the way home from the pub. We had a number of uh, songs. Um, I took the um, executive, including the AFL executive, down to my beach house, uh, which is uh, down in northern New South Wales, a little village called Woolai. We all got together. We are all very keen surfers at that stage, and even those who weren't, like Andrew, um, uh, sorry, like Andrew uh, Catterall, well, he was learning at the time, and, uh, and Travis Ald, our CEO, um, everyone uh, went along and we went surfing and then we went to the bowls club and we started to listen to some of these songs through the day and the present song grew on us and as the night sort of progressed uh, uh, and we'd had a couple of beers, it sort of felt okay as we were singing walking down the street to the house and, uh, and that was sort of where the, uh, where the song was born. Um, so, uh, yeah, so they were, they were uh, intense but... but Really fun, uh, fun times. With much of the foundations for a club built, attention soon turned to on-field matters. In launching a new club into the now thriving national competition for the first time since Fremantle 16 years earlier, and in a difficult market no less, the AFL learned from its mistakes with previous list builds, and they granted the Suns an eye-popping array of draft assets and salary cap assistance. Initially, the Suns were able to sign 12 17-year-olds from around the country, Although only a few of these became household names, the best were probably Mav Weller, Alex Keith and Trent McKenzie. The Suns then stunned the Australian sporting world by signing Brisbane Rugby League star Carmichael Hunt, who switched codes to play for the Gold Coast from 2010. It was a move that helped the Suns make a media splash in the NRL mad state, but one that many felt, first year coach McKenna included, was a huge mistake. As well as Hunt and the 17 year old prospects, the Suns also bolstered their VFL list with experienced rookies Daniel Harris, Michael Code, Sam Isles and Danny Stanley. 
Gold Coast, however, were still missing elite seasoned AFL talent, and the Suns were determined to snare some of the league's best uncontracted players. However, despite being armed with an extra $1 million of salary cap space, Thomas recalls it being a tough sell to lure players north due to the threadbare facilities. Probably the one area that you sort of sit back and you go, um, that was that was difficult. I remember the AFL came up and said, look, we're going to build you a temporary facility, which was uh, like a small compound of, of ATCO sheds, you know, and, and we were meant to be there for, I think it was about two years max, and that turned into... Um, uh, about seven or eight years, not through anyone's fault. It was just took some time to probably get the right level of funding again for a performance centre and Commonwealth Games just happened to bob up in that period and, and that presented an opportunity to secure a whole bunch of funding, but it was going to be at a later level than what we'd probably hoped for. So again, Queensland Government were instrumental in helping that to happen would have been probably a little bit sooner had it not been for that major event and, and funding that was going into that and we got wrapped up into it. But it was certainly tough early on in terms of recruitment and different things, I would have thought, for, for our list management team because, you know, here we were, a bright, new, shiny club at a great destination like the Gold Coast come and play footy and, and you had the likes of Gary Ablett walk through and get a tour or Carmichael Hunt at the time. And they'd come from Brisbane Broncos facility and the Geelong Cats facility, which would have been, you know, five star at that point and we sort of said we'll come through our high performance center and it was a a, a hut out the back of, of the stadium and i remember we had snakes we had two snakes in the office during work hours which we posted on our social channels we had players grabbing pythons off roofs on on some occasions at lunch yeah it was tough it was probably um you look back with some fondness now and have a bit of a laugh but yeah certainly those early days were yeah tough going out of those offices where we had probably 30 odd commercial and um, membership and media staff housed within a, a really small sort of hut for want of a better word and operating out of that but yeah footy got on with it the players got on with it administrators got on with it you never heard anyone sort of whinging or anything like that it was um, we're here to, to sort of launch the club and there was enough fun and excitement through that. The club's inaugural AFL squad was also impacted by the amateurish facilities. Local lad Charlie Dixon, the first ever signing for the club's 2009 TAC Cup season, recalled on Will Schofield's Backchat podcast myriad mishaps at the club's ramshackle training facilities, including a broken leg to coach McKenna during a training session. Before they started building Carrara, the stadium, yeah. so it was Carrara back then and it was a we, I grew up, so well, all the footy I did was at that. I mean, it was a big sort of big so it was ground. Like a home ground. It was like a home ground huh. sort of thing. And um, and then we went and then they built a big tin shed for our gym. But before they did that, we were in demountables like no bigger than this room. And you got like 40 blokes in there lifting, like doing bench press and <laughs> doing dumbbell, like all this other weird stuff. And then, then they built us a big tin shed. That's where all the gym stuff was, like, and then um, bikes and all that stuff was in there. And and then when they started demolishing Carrara, they moved that, picked that shed up, moved it down to the back near the river. And then we trained out at the, on the soccer ovals, which our guy McKenna, he broke his ankle out there Ooh. doing some training with us. Oh, in a divot. In a divot, yeah. And then same with... Um, any players like Harrow? He did a um, wow. he did a yeah did an ankle had to get surgery, like it was an absolute goat track. Despite these obstacles faced, the Suns were able to nail some battle-hardened senior recruits to bolster their squad. The first was Adelaide's Nathan Bock, who had forged a reputation as one of the league's premier key defenders. Bock recalls getting a heads up from his manager that the Suns were interested in making him a marquee signing midway through the 2010 season. When you know the Suns were announced. Coming into the competition, they obviously had um, access to recruit one uncontracted player from every every club um, yeah, in the AFL. So, yeah, there was a lot of speculation, I think, sort of that 2010 season, um, early, early mid-on. And then I, yeah, I was uh, approached by my manager who, who had a pretty good relationship with recruiting manager yeah. uh, for the Suns at the time. So, yeah, so my manager approached me sort of mid-season. It was sort of just a couple of off-the-cuff the conversations, but there was interest there. So, yeah, 
by sort of mid late in the season. I think we actually played a game up here on the Gold Coast uh, that year, 2010, mm. and I think we played Richmond. And I actually met with Guy McKenna during that period or well, that weekend when I was playing up here. So just had a conversation with him, and then obviously nothing was formally done. You know, obviously that was all had to be done within the guidelines of the AFL and, and you know, recruiting and whatnot. Up until the end of the season, it was just a, a verbal sort of commitment and what made it difficult was I obviously had to put off contract talks with, with, with Adelaide. They come to the table with an offer. Obviously the Suns offer and length of contract was substantially higher, you know, extremely higher. You know, you're talking chalk and cheese. So, you know, that that was where the decision sort of made it quite tough in, in a degree because obviously I was from Adelaide, spent yeah. nine years at Adelaide Obviously, didn't really want to want to leave. or would have liked to stay there and been a one club player. But also, as you're getting towards the back end of your career, you've also got look longevity and you know financial sort of stability and whatnot. So you know the, the offer was sort of yeah, obviously too good to refuse. You know, financially probably would have been an irresponsible yeah. decision um, not to go. Bock was an important signing for the Suns, alongside veterans Jared Brennan. Campbell Brown, Josh Fraser, Jared Harbrow, Nathan Cracker and Michael Riscatelli. But Gold Coast really hit the jackpot by securing the signature of the biggest name in the game, Gary Ablett Jr. Great news for Gary Ablett, the former Geelong superstar turned Gold Coast Suns marquee player. He has just been announced as their captain. He's been given the honour of leading the club in their inaugural season. Nathan Bock is vice-captain. Campbell Brown is the deputy vice-captain. And, of course, it feels a long-held ambition. The audacious, multi-million dollar recruitment of the Little Master was a huge on and off-field coup. Alongside rugby league star Hunt, Ablett was a gigantic marketing, sponsorship and community fillip for the Suns, and his exploits on the field more than matched his off-field commercial impact. Such was Ablett's immense talent, he was able to retain his status as the game's premier player as the Suns sprang to life despite poor facilities, inexperience in key leadership positions and an immature playing list. For others though, the club's dire facilities made things difficult in preparation for their entry to the AFL in 2011. And it wasn't until I'd actually signed and got up here that I actually saw the, the training facility, which, you know, in hindsight, you know, hindsight's always a, a beautiful thing. It would have been nice to probably have a look at all those things. Whether that would have, you know, changed my decision, probably not. What was, and yeah, obviously you probably hear this if you speak to any of the inaugural Suns players and whatnot, what I was annoyed at was we were sort of told once the new stadium was built, our facilities in terms of training facilities were going to be put in place then and there as well. So second season would have all that stuff. I I spent the whole four years pretty much training out of a, uh, well, the, what the demountables pretty much. So we're just talking construction type demountable bulls that were our, you know, meeting room, uh, locker room. Um, our gym was in a in a in a tin shed effectively with no air conditioning. So you can imagine how hot that would have been in the middle of summer. A massive tin shed, which which was our gym, and the club didn't get those facilities, the new facilities, done for I think six or seven years. So there would have been players that spent you know their whole career training out of you know substandard you know AFL facilities, like it was. Yeah, it was, it was pretty bad, <laughs> to yeah. be honest. So, yeah, listen, in, in that aspect, and I was leaving Adelaide, who just had a $20 million, you know, refurb of their training facilities, you know, high, you know, as, as good a gym and uh, facilities as you could have asked for. So, you know, in that aspect, yeah, a bit challenging. But would it have changed my decision? Probably not. You know, I was, I was coming up here knowing, you know, it was a start-up club, that we we're going to struggle, and that was just what we had to had to sort of you know expect and deal with. You know, someone like Gary, you know, he he didn't even you know his whole time up here. I don't think he had the new facilities to experience. So you know, he, he was he was up here a lot longer than I was. So yeah, um, I think he would have been happy when he got back to Geelong, that's for sure. After finishing a promising fifth in the TAC Cup season and then tenth in the VFL, what would year one hold for the AFL's newest team with a young, inexperienced squad? Most expected the Suns to struggle, and struggle mightily they did, with three beltings to start the 2011 AFL season. However, they broke through for their maiden win earlier than most people expected, 
shocking Port Adelaide in Adelaide for a thrilling three-point victory in round four. Ratchet, they might score the goal to win. Matera has been lurking. Russell, that could be the oh, killer. Oh, he's kicked it. That could be the killer. This is his moment. Oh, he's, he's out it. to the right. And they've won. Glory lost forever. The Gold Coast Suns have their first ever AFL win. Two weeks later, they again stunned the football world by beating crosstown rivals Brisbane in the first Q clash, with Nathan Cracker the unlikely hero with five goals. The win soon dried up though, with the Suns only tasting success once more before season's end, finishing dead last on the ladder with a 3-19 record and a percentage of just 56. Things didn't improve much in the next few years, with the Suns only avoiding a second consecutive wooden spoon thanks to the arrival of GWS in 2012. But while the Giants eventually clawed their way up the ladder to become one of the league's more consistent finals performers, Gold Coast's on-field efforts have, for the most part, been disappointing. It's hard not to compare the difficulties of the Suns against the success of fellow newcomers GWS, and Withereth believes the Giants' willingness to push the boundaries and even push back against the AFL itself is something Gold Coast should have perhaps implemented. Um, I, I think it's probably true to say that if you look at uh, the Gold Coast Suns and you say compare us to the Giants, it, it's what I call sort of big brother, little brother. So if you look at a family um, arrangement, um, the first born um, tends to uh, want to um, be I ideal, uh, live up to mum and dad's expectations, mum and dad... Uh, set the rules and, and there's sort of an expectation that firstborn live with that. By the time secondborn comes along, the rules are starting to be waived a bit. They've seen what's important and what's not important. And of course, subsequent children come along and you, and at that point in time, people are only worried about what's important. So um, I think it was the same uh, for AFL. We were, we had to fight hard with other clubs to get basic concessions and and they were never even locked in right up until almost draft night. Uh, we were still fighting for concessions. And then you look at what happened uh, the subsequent years with GWS, and they had basically twice the number of concessions that we had, spread over a two-year period across two drafts. And they got it right. Without doubt, they got it right, because you had more people, you had the better opportunity to trade. We had a limited number of talented people, footy guys, formed a view that best strategy would be to develop those people with some externals that we could bring in. And of course, that was a hard market to try and get externals uh, because people are locked into contracts. And so a development strategy was, was the way to go. I think without doubt, anyone now will tell you that the correct strategy is overcompensate in terms of picks, get those picks bidded, bid back into the system in exchange for quality players and get a strong team out as fast as you can get it out. And and the second area that I think everyone learned big lessons from was that we, myself, uh, I think I'm naturally a rule follower. I think Travis Ald is naturally a rule follower. We'd fought hard and settled on a set of financial criteria and concessions, and we strictly lived within that. You know, we we were operating out of a tin shed uh, because we hadn't been able to raise enough money to build a training administration base. Um, you know, we'd have young players who they were trying to build up, um, sweating so much in this tin shed that they were actually losing weight, not not putting on weight. There were issues like that, but we lived uh, within the rules. And, and then if you compare GWS, well, rules were there to... Uh, uh, be acknowledged, but nothing more. And so they would spend a lot more money and uh, and it was a great frustration for Andrew and for uh, Gil McLaughlin, Andrew Dimitri and Gil McLaughlin. But nonetheless, the bills got paid and, uh, and and through, I guess, those two things, a greater range of concessions and, and an acknowledgement only of the rules, um, they have done a fabulous job and we're still working uh, to pull together... Uh, uh, a footy department, but I'm absolutely certain that this year uh, uh, we'll see the ultimate uh, results of all of that effort. Football is a win-loss industry, so it's perhaps not unfair for people to judge the Suns purely from an on-field perspective, in which case it can only be said that Gold Coast has been nothing short of a failure so far in its brief history. However, that's not the full story. As anyone who has helped launch teams in non-footy states will attest, it's hard enough to build a club from scratch in a footy-mad environment, 
but the challenge is infinitely greater in Queensland and New South Wales. What can't be argued is the Sun's broader impact on the Gold Coast community, Queensland football and the AFL itself. I'm trying to choose the right word, but um, extraordinary, I think, is, is the starting point for it. You see, without the Suns, without Metricon Stadium, you wouldn't have a Commonwealth Games. Without the Commonwealth Games, you wouldn't have the major sporting infrastructure. So about nearly a billion dollars worth of sport Sporting infrastructure was built uh, from the northern Gold Coast, which are which are sort of a stretched growth corridor uh, suburbs, all the way down to the border. And you've got an expanding Gold Coast. There's lots of suburbs full of young families with frankly nothing to do and no transport to connect them. So, if ever you had a situation where you could have social disorder, that's what was brewing. Um, and the sporting infrastructure that's been facilitated through the efforts grounded by the Gold Coast Suns, has dominantly changed the way people live on the Gold Coast. So so the, the magnitude of that just can't be, be overlooked. I mean, on year two, I remember looking at these numbers, there was 63,000 uh, interstate visitors came in the first two years to the Suns. Now, the Suns been going now for uh, coming up 13 years. And so you can just get a sense of the scale of the impact of that volume of people coming up, taking hotel rooms, flying in, flying out, the spends in restaurants and hospitality. So, so the numbers are incredible. The boys themselves, they're doing sort of 5,000 hours plus of community service and they're triggering and they triggered sort of a whole different mentality across different sporting clubs uh, in terms of the way people contribute to the, to the, uh, to the city. So, so from a city-wide perspective, their contribution has been, um, or the club's contribution has been quite extraordinary, which is why they're so strongly supported by the state government, by the Gold Coast City Council and, and by, you know, the community as a whole. Um, on, the, on the footy field, AFL was sort of known on the, on, in Queensland and on the Gold Coast, but when I went to school, it was rugby league and rugby union. You know, there was, AFL was sort of known but certainly not dominant the major private schools and state schools had no afl ovals or facilities if you look at that when we first started this in 2006 and you look at the participation rates now queensland is the one of the fastest growing markets we're starting but not yet there to fill the number of people that are available in the draft Noticed with some interest and some amusement the fact that, uh, you know, we've been able to draft four of our own out of our own academy and uh, the footy world's in uproar about it. But you look at the participation rate and then you look at the engagement and then you say to yourself, OK, um, how is that monetized for the rest of the game? And you look at the media rights landscape. The impact has been nothing short of extraordinary. So, so the Gold Coast Suns, uh, yes, w- there wouldn't be a single person who isn't disappointed about the fact that we haven't all been on a plane and uh, and been down there for the big dance, as it's referred to as, uh, but this year. But the impact of the Gold Coast Suns, uh, its impact nationally on, on football, its impact on the life of people who uh, live and reside on the Gold Coast has, has just been nothing short of extraordinary. The challenge now, of course, is for the Suns to match their off-field impact with their on-field endeavours. With three-time Premiership coach Damien Hardwick now at the helm and the list once again bursting with talent, the time is now for Gold Coast to finally flex its muscles in a competitive sense. Because while their impact on the Queensland sporting landscape and the Gold Coast community are nothing short of impressive, they will ultimately be judged by those outside the club on wins and losses. Thanks for listening to AFL Team Builders, a ZeroHanger.com production. Next week, in our final episode, we examine another expansion club which faced the daunting task of establishing itself in hostile territory, the GWS Giants. While the AFL's newest team has now become an on-field success story, the battle to win the hearts and minds of Sydney's West is far from over. To go to the smallest club in Australia with the least amount of resources, uh, I was 21 years old, the 35, 18-year-olds, as much as I was young, felt like I was much older than those guys. 